From around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Data Automated, an event series brought to you by IO Tahoe. Okay, we're back with Adam Worthington, who's the CTO and co-founder of Ethos. Adam, good to see you. How are things across the pond? Good, thank you. Uh, I'm sure our weather's a little bit worse than yours is over the other side, but, uh, but good. Hey, so let's, uh, let's set it up. Tell us about yourself, what your role is as CTO, and, and give us the lowdown on Ethos. Sure, so yeah, Adam Worthington, as you said, CTO and co-founder of Ethos. So we're a, a pretty young company ourselves, so we're in our, our sixth year. And, and we specialize in uh, emerging disruptive technologies, so within the infrastructure data center kind of cloud space. And, and my role is the technical lead. So uh, it's kind of my job to be an expert in all of the technologies that we work with, which can be a bit of a challenge if you have a huge portfolio. One of the reasons we've got a deliberately focused one, and uh, and also uh, kind of key to the technical validation and evaluation of new technologies and, uh, and new vendors that we potentially have. So you guys are really technology experts, data experts, and probably also expert in process and delivering customer outcomes, right? That's a, a great word there, Dave. Outcomes. I mean, that's a lot of what I like to speak to customers about. But, and, and sometimes that gets, that gets lost, particularly with, uh, within highly technical fields, uh, like a virtualization guy or a network guy can very quickly start talking about the nuts and bolts of technology. And, and I'm a techie, I'm absolutely a nerd, like the best techies are, uh, but fundamentally we're putting in technology to meet business outcomes, meet business, uh, to solve business problems, and, uh, and to enable uh, a better way of doing things fundamentally, and that's what we try to do. Love it, we love tech too, but really it's all about the customer. So let's talk about smart data. You know, when you, when you throw out terms like this, it kind of can feel buzzwordy, but let's, let's get into the meat on it. What does that mean to you? Uh, what are the critical aspects of so-called smart data? Cool, well it will probably be, help to step back a little bit and set, set the scene a, a little bit more in, in terms of kind of where I came from so, and the types of problems I saw out in the field. So I'm uh, really an infrastructure or solution architect by trade. And what I kind of relatively organically, but over time, my personal framework and approach, I, uh, I focused on three core design principles. So simplicity, flexibility, and efficiency. So whatever it was I was designing, and obviously they mean different things depending on what the technology area is that we're working with, but that's put me in pretty good stead. Uh, and what uh, I realized, or we realized when we started Ethos, was that those principles could be uh, could be used more broadly in that the absolute best of the new breed of technologies and those that really disrupt uh, significantly improve upon the status quo in one or more of those three areas, ideally all three uh, in terms of uh, being more simple, more flexible, more efficient. Uh, and if we look at uh, data and the challenges that uh, organizations and enterprises, so organizations of a particular size have around data and kind of smart data and the best way of doing things, uh, maybe it's good to reflect on what the opposite end of the story is, kind of why data is often quite dumb. Uh, so traditional approaches, we have kind of limited visibility into the data that we're actually storing and using within our infrastructure. And what we've kind of ended up with over time, through no fault of the organizations that actually have infrastructures like this, but there are kind of silos everywhere. So silos of expertise, so whether that be that's born out of specialized teams for virtualization, for networking, database admin, for example, and silos of infrastructure, which create data fragmentation. So copies of data in different areas of the infrastructure and copies of uh, replication in that data set or replication in terms of application environment. Uh, and so that's kind of what we tend to focus on. And what is becoming uh, and resonating with more and more organizations. There's a survey that uh, one of the vendors that we've worked with, actually our launch vendor, sort of five and a half years ago, a, a vendor called Cohesity, who you've got on the panel later. They, they partnered with a company called uh, Vance and Bourne to do a, a first of type kind of global market survey. Uh, 900 respondents, all different sectors, all, all different uh, countries, so US, UK, Germany, a bunch of others. And what they found was, pretty shocking, uh, it was 
a cohesivity survey, so that it's focused on secondary data, but the, the kind of lessons learned and the information taken out of that survey applies right across the gamut of infrastructure data organizations. And just some stats just to pull out. So from my notes, 85% uh, of the organizations surveyed store between two and five, store their data in between two and five public clouds. 63% of organizations have between four and 15 copies of exactly the same data. Uh, nearly nine out of 10 of respondents believe their organization's secondary data is fragmented across the silos that I touched on and is or will become nearly impossible to manage over the long term. And 91% of the vast majority of organizations' leadership were concerned about the level of visibility their teams have into the data stored within their infrastructure. So they're the kind of areas that a smart approach to data will directly address. So reducing uh, silos, uh, so that comes from simplifying, so moving away from complexity of infrastructure, reducing the amount of copies of data that we have across the infrastructure, and re uh, reducing the amount of application environments that we need for different, uh, different areas. So the smarter we get with data is, the, in my eyes anyway, the further we move away from those traditional leg and legacy. Wow, there was a lot in that answer, but so I want to kind of summarize if I, if I can. I mean, sure. you, talk, you started with simplicity, flexibility, efficiency. Of course, that's what customers want. And then I was going to ask you about, you know, what challenges customers are, are facing, and I think you laid it out here. But I want to, I want to pick, on, uh, pick, pick up on some of the data that you talked about, the, the public cloud creep. I mean, that adds complexity and, and diversity in, in skill requirements. The copies of data, it's so true. It's like data is just, like fribbles, if you're a Star Trek fan, and just they just you know expand and and replicate. So that's an expense, and it adds complexity. Siloed data means you spend a lot of time trying to figure out you know who's got the right data, what's the real truth. So there's a lot of manual processes involved, and then the visibility is obviously critical. So those are the the problems, uh, and and of course you sort of talked about how you address those. But, but how does it work? I mean, how, in other words, what's involved in injecting smarts into your data life cycle? Well, if we think about it, um, so in terms of the, the infrastructure, and as I say, there are very good reasons why customers are in the situation they have and then users are in the situation that, that they're in. Uh, because of the, the limits of uh, traditional approaches to infrastructure. So if you look at something as fundamental as storage, for example, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, applications that utilize data, something as fundamental as backup and archive. Now, often what that typically requires is completely separate infrastructure to everything else. So, uh, uh, but when we're talking about the data set, so uh, what would be perfect is if we could back up the data and use it for other things. And that's where a, uh, a, a technology provider like Cohesity can come in. So although it, their technology is incredibly simple, uh, it's also incredibly powerful and allows simplification and consolidation of data. And then if you look at uh, just getting insight out of that data, fundamentally traditional approaches to infrastructure, they're put in for a point purpose, they're put in for a point requirement. And so therefore there, it wasn't really incumbent on them to uh, expose any information out of the data that's stored within these traditional infrastructure solutions which makes it really tricky to do anything else outside of the kind of point application environment. And that, that's where something like uh, IO Tahoe can come in in terms of uh, abstracting away the complexity and more directly delivering business insights. Uh, so these are the kind of key areas. So I think one of my, uh, actually I didn't have this quote ready, but genuinely one of my favorite uh, quotes is from the uh, French philosopher and, uh, and mathematician Blaise Pascal. He, he said, uh, if I get this right, I'd have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. So there's real, uh, I love that quote for lots of reasons, right. you know, direct that application in terms of what we're talking about. In terms of, it has, is actually really complicated to develop a technology capability to make things simple, to more directly meet the needs of the business through tech, to provide self-service capability. And I don't just mean self-driving, I mean, making data and infrastructure make sense to the business users that are using it. My belief is that uh, uh, technology uh, shouldn't mean that the users of the technology have to be technology experts. What we really want them to be, and they should be, is business experts, and any technology they use should enable and inform what they're looking to achieve. And that's the types of 
technologies that get me excited, so not necessarily from a techie geek, complicated technology perspective, but those that are really focused on simplicity, capability, and consolidation. Yeah, okay, so you talked about backup. You know, we're going to hear from Cohesity a little bit later and, and, and beyond backup, data protection, data, data management. That insight piece, you talked earlier about visibility, and that's what the IO Tahoe is bringing to the table with its software, so that's another component of the tech stack, if you will. Um, and then you talk about simplicity, we're going to hear from Pure Storage, they're all about you know, simple storage, they call it the modern data experience, I think, so, so those are some of the, the aspects. And your job, correct me if I'm wrong, is to kind of put that all together in a solution and then help the customer you know, realize what we talked about earlier, that business outcome. Yeah, and that's, um, it's sitting at both sides and understanding both sides. So kind of key to us uh, and our ability to be able to deliver on exactly what you just said is being experts in the capabilities and newer and better ways of doing things, but also having the kind of uh, the, the business understanding to be able to ask the right questions to identify how newer, better approaches could, could help solve these issues. And uh, yeah, you touched on yeah, three vendors that we work with that you have on the panel, uh, three genuinely, of, uh, I think, of the most uh, exciting and innovative technology providers there are out there, uh, the, uh, Cohesity, Your Storage, and IO Tahoe. But Pure's a great one. So yes, a, a lot of uh, the way that they've made their way in the market is through simplicity and uh, through uh, reducing uh, data redundancy, et cetera. But uh, another area that I really like is uh, with their platforms, you can do more with less. And that's not just about uh, reducing data redundancy, that's about creating application environments that can service uh, then the infrastructure to service different requirements that are able to uh, do the, the random IO thing without getting too kind of low level tech, as well as the sequential. So what that means is that you don't necessarily have to move data from application environment A, do one thing, manipulate it, and then move it to application environment B, to application environment three, in terms of an analytics kind of left to right workflow, you keep the data where it is, use it for different uh, different requirements within the infrastructure, and again, do more with less. And what that does, it's not just about simplicity and efficiency, it significantly reduces the time to value of that data as well. And that again resonates that, if I was to pick up a soundbite that, that resonates with all of the vendors we have on the panel later, the, the way that they're able to uh, a better, a better TCO, better ROI, and significantly reduce the time to value of data is something that they all have. But to answer your question, yeah, I, I, you're exactly right. So it's key to us to uh, uh, kind of position, understand customer requirements, position the right technology with the right vendors and help them achieve and do better than they are. Adam, I wonder if you could give us your insights based on your experience with customers in terms of what success looks like. I'm interested in what they're measuring. I mean, I'm big on end-to-end -end cycle times and taking a systems view, but of course, you know, customers, they want to measure everything, whether it's you know, productivity of the developers or, you know, time to insights, et cetera. What are, they, what are the KPIs that are driving success and, and outcomes? Well, those, the KPIs, uh, and historically in our space, they've always been a bit woolly when you talk about total cost of ownership, you talk about return on investment, and you talk about time to value. Uh, and I've worked in many different types of companies and many different types of uh, uh, infrastructure, often quite complicated requirements and infrastructure to service them. Uh, and being able to put together anything particularly realistic uh, that gets proven out once the solution gets put in around ROI and TCO is, is challenging. But now with these newer, better approaches that are simpler, more flexible and more efficient, uh, enables you to uh, really build a true story and uh, and replicate whatever you kind of promised around kind of ROI, PCO. And the key thing, as you say, from data, and I've said it a couple of times now, is time to value. So, so what, we, what we help in terms of the scoping and in terms of the understanding what the requirements are, we specifically call out business outcomes, what, uh, what organizations are looking to achieve, and then tack on those metrics uh, to those to those outcomes. But what that does is uh, a few different things, but it, it uh, provides a certain success criteria, whether that's success criteria within a proof of concept or a success criteria of an overall solution that you put in, and being able to speak that language and, as I, as I said before, more directly meet the needs of the business through tech in a kind of crystallized, defined way is 
Uh, we're only realistically able to do, do that now with the types of technologies that we're working with historically it's been borderline. Yeah, so when you think about the business case, the ROI, a benefit over cost of benefit, and obviously lower TCO, you lower the denominator, you're going to increase the, the output and the value. And but I would I would really stress that I think the numerator ultimately, especially in this world of data, is the most important. And I think the TCO is fundamental, it's really it's becoming table stakes. You got to have simple, you got to have efficient, you got to be agile, but it it enables that that numerator whether that's new customer revenue, maybe, you know, maybe cost savings across the, the business. And again, that comes from taking that systems view. Um, do you have examples that you can share with us, even if they're anonymized, of customers that you've, you've worked with that are maybe a little further down on the journey or, or maybe not, and things that you can share with us that are kind of proof points here? Sure, it's, uh, it's quite easy and very gratifying. When you've, when you've spoken to a customer, look, we know you've been doing it this way for years and this is the way that your infrastructure architecture looks like or your data architecture. If you did it like this, if we implemented this technology or this new approach, then we will enable you to, something as simple but often really powerful, is reduce your rack footprint from a storage perspective. So I've worked on a project where a customer reduced their rack footprint from, I think it was, it was nine, it was just under 10, it was nine fully loaded rack, rack which were just full of disks, which were providing the fundamental underlying storage architecture. And they were able to consolidate that, that down and provide additional capacity, significantly greater performance in less than half a rack. Or uh, looking at the, you mentioned data protection earlier. So uh, another organization, this is a project which is just kind of nearing completion at the moment, huge organization, they've literally petabytes of, uh, of data that was, that was servicing their uh, their backup and archive and what they had is not just these reams of data they had i think i'm right in saying five different backup applications that they had dependent on the uh, uh what area of infrastructure they were backing up so wh whether it was uh, virtualization that was different to they were backing up db2s different they were backing up another database environment they were using something else in the cloud so a consolidated uh, approach that we, that we recommended to work with them on they were able to significantly reduce complexity and reduce the amount of time that it took them. Um, what they were able to achieve, and this was again one of the key requirements they had, they'd gone above the threshold of being able to back up all of their infrastructure. When they tried to do a, a DR test uh, to spin everything back up in a, in a secondary data center, they weren't able to achieve it within the, uh, in the time scales that the, uh, the data, uh, disaster recovery and business continuity plan dictated. So with this, we were able to prove them with a kind of proof uh, just before they went into production, a DR test using the new approach, and they were able to recover everything, the entire infrastructure in well, minutes actually, in terms of the production, uh, the production workload. And this was in comparison to hours, and that was those hours is just with a handful of workloads. They were able to get up and running with the entire estate in, I think it was something like an hour, and the core production uh, systems they were up and running practically instantaneously. So if you if you look at really kind of stepping back what these customers are looking to achieve, they want to be able to, if there is any issues, recover from those issues as quickly as possible, understand what they're dealing with from an infrastructure perspective, reduce costs. Uh, and another uh, customer that, that we worked with recently, what they had huge challenges around and they were understandably very scared about GDPR. So this was a little while ago, Actually, it's still, it's not a, a conversation that's gone away, just about everybody I still speak to has got issues and concerns around GDPR compliance, understanding where their data is stored and putting them in a, in a position to be able to effectively react to subject access requests. That was something that was a, a key metric, a key target for, for an infrastructure solution that we worked with. And we were able to provide them with the insight of the into their data set and uh, enable them to uh, react to compliance and adhere to yeah, subject access requests that we, we created in uh, significantly less time and significantly less effort than they would do. Awesome, I, I thank you for that. I want to pick up on it a little bit. So the first example is, sure. can you get your infrastructure in order to bust down those silos. And what I've, uh, when I talk to customers and I've talked to a number in banks, insurance companies, other financial services, uh, manufacturers, when they're able to sort of streamline that data life cycle and bring in automation and intelligence, if you will, 
what they tell me is now they're able to obviously compress the time to value, but also they're loading up on way more initiatives and projects that they can deliver for the business. And you talked before about, about the line of business having self-serve. The businesses feel like they, they actually are really you know, invested in the data, that it's their data, that it's not you know, confusing and a lot of finger pointing. So, so that's, that's huge. Uh, and I think that you know, your other example is right on as well of, of really you know, clear business value that organizations are seeing. So you know, thanks for those. Uh, you know, now is the time really uh, to, to, to get these houses in order, if you will, because it really drives competitive advantage, especially take your second example in this isolation economy, you know, being able to respond to things like privacy are just increasingly critical. Adam, give us the final thoughts, bring us home uh, in this segment. Well, the final thoughts and something uh, yeah, we didn't particularly touch on, but I think is, is kind of slightly, slightly hidden and isn't spoken about as, as much as I think it could be, is that traditional approaches to infrastructure, we've already touched on uh, that the, they could be complicated uh, and there's lack of efficiency, it impacts uh, 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 a user's ability to be agile. But what you find with traditional approaches, and you've already touched on some of the kind of benefits of new approaches there, is that they're often very prescriptive. They're designed for a particular purpose. Uh, the, the infrastructure environment, the way that it's served up to the users in a kind of a, a packaged kind of way means that they need to use it in, that, in whatever way it's been dictated. So that kind of self-service uh, aspect comes in from a flexibility standpoint. So these platforms and this platform approach, which is the right way to address technology in my eyes, enables it the infrastructure to be used flexibly. So the, the business users and the data users, what you find is if uh, you put in uh, this capability into their hands, they start innovating in the way that the, 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 they use that data and the way that they bring benefits to business. And if a, a, a platform is too prescriptive, then they aren't able to do that. So what you're doing with these new approaches is get yeah, all of the metrics that we've touched on, it's fantastic from a cost standpoint, from an agility standpoint. But what it means is that the innovators in the business, the ones that really really understand what they're looking to achieve, they now have the tools to innovate with that business. And I think, and I've started to see that with projects that we've completed, if you do it in the right way, if you articulate the capability and you empower the business users in the right way, then they're in a significantly better position, these businesses, to take advantage of this and really uh, kind of match and significantly beat off in their competition in whatever space it is. Super, Adam. I mean, really exciting space. I mean, we spent the last 10 years gathering all this data, you know, trying to slog through it and figure it out. And now with the tools that we have and the automation capabilities, it really is a new era of, of innovation and, and insight. So Adam Worthington, thanks so much for coming in the Cube and participating uh, in this program. No, exciting times and uh, thank you very much to Dave, Dave for inviting me and yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right, stay safe and thank you everybody. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube.